everyone, and welcome once again to the Coyote and Crow talk show. Uh, right now, coming to you live from Gen Con. And this week, we're going to talk a little about moccasing in general, because everyone has questions about a new setting, right? At least I think so. And in a new setting, you're going to need a new character, and that means a new set of miniatures. And for that, I would recommend no one higher than Hero Forge. Lando, what do we have to say about Hero yeah, Forge? Hero Forge is excellent. Um, you can make a character in as little as five minutes, or as long as like I've spent like four hours, like getting the minutia of the detail of the color. There's so many things you can customize with Hero Forge. It's excellent especially for people that have really no artistic talent in terms of drawing, but want a way to create their character in a way that other people can visualize it. And not only can you use it like on an online atmosphere, but you can also use it um, and actually purchase the mini itself. And they come in different types. You can get them painted or unpainted if you'd like to paint them yourself. So there's all kinds of options. Hero Forge is great for characters of all kinds. Can't recommend them enough. Wonderful. And joining me today is the illustrious Lando. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jade should be along presently, and I cannot wait. I am Logan Bose. I am a writer, editor, bunch of things of the Absaliga tribe. And today we are talking a little about Coyote and Crow's world of moccasin. Uh, awesome. Lando, what specifically comes to mind for questions when you hear about this that, that's a great question honestly um the first kind of question that comes to mind is like what the overall feel of of the setting is i know i know we we, we touched on that a, a bit when the during the character creation but like can describe it to me kind of as like a like a top down kind of view in terms of this overarching kind of thing because I, I I still, you know, don't feel like I have a, a good grasp on exactly what's going on in, in the setting. Sure. So top down, it is America without the Colombian exchange, America uncolonized. It yeah. is the idea of what the natives could have built with a little bit of a different history. Mm. At its heart, it's an alternate history game focusing heavily on uh, technology, uh, spiritualism, and overall, I would say that it has a very, a very, I don't want to say utopian atmosphere because it's not utopia. Hmm. It's just not a capitalist hellscape. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, you know, I, I did I did mention, and I think you confirmed, uh, I, I mentioned uh, solar punk. So, yes. you know, the it seems like the technology is more advanced than than today, or at least or at least the the direction of what's important for the ways in which technology advances are in different uh, like different arenas or different directions. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, like, there is no uh, gunpowder in this um, world, so there's never been a combustion engine. Mm. There's no um, okay. firearms, per se. A lot of technology revolves around magnets. Um, so, it is a very different world. Like, there's no wheat, so there's no wheat products. Oh, um, okay. There's no... There's no cows, there's no pigs, there's no chickens. Um, it's everything is endemic to North America pre Columbus. So, um, interestingly enough, several tribes did not have um, fry bread, of course. Fry bread is often seen as native cuisine, and there's a growing push uh, to remind people that no, it's a symbol of colonialism mm. um, because of its origins on the Trail of Tears. But other tribes did have uh, sweet treats and bread-like things made with um, cornmeal and various other items like that. And if you go far enough south, you did hit uh, where they would make things like tortillas and 
uh, but all of that is uh, that's getting a bit far afield from Cahokia, which is where the current uh, system focuses its eyes a little more. Gotcha. Is it in that that Kohoki? Co I don't want to butcher the pronunciation. Is that a city in in the setting? Yes. Okay. Cahokia, not just in the setting. Cahokia was a real life town a real life city um it focus it served as a trade hub for many many years before it was abandoned um and the cahokian mounds are a national park outside of st louis area on the river of on the banks of the mississippi river um which does exist except it goes back to its original pronunciation of mississippi um but Cahokia within um, Coyote and Crow functions as not only a trade city, but the nominal capital of what's called the Freelands. And within Coyote and Crow, you end up with several nation states, tribes banded together um, and created different, uh, different, different nation states, basically. Um, the Freelands are much more loose. They take up the majority of what we think of as the midwest and everything north and south of that basically we also have um to the west we've got what's called the t-swak alliance which um most of coyote and crow focuses on the freelance and cahokia itself it functions and focuses on um areas around this central hub city because it's so new and of course as time goes on uh certain things are going to get expanded upon certain other things are going yeah. to uh we're going to find out a little more about the t-swak alliance and the hadanase confederacy and the ezkin empire and um because the ezkin empire is basically in the same area where what we think of as texas today okay because let's face it texas is gonna texas yeah, yeah. And then you go a little further and you hit azayang and abayang which are north and south or south and central america okay um and again we haven't delved too far into that particular uh area but as time goes on, of course, we will um, find out a little more about that. Gotcha. But and, are you, and if you go, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, if you go a little further north, you're going to hit the permanent ice zone because most of uh, Canada has essentially been taken over by ice flows, and its expeditions sent there don't tend to return. Oh. Nice. So, you know, kind of like real life, stay out of Canada, except for different <laughs> reasons. Because, you know, real life, you might never want to leave. And right. uh, in Coyote and Crow, you're not going to get the chance. <laughs> you uh -huh. can't. Even if you wanted to. So, down to what we think of as the Southwest, the Florida, Louisiana region, we have the Kitawagi Federation. Um, and then between the Freelands and the Ezkin Empire is the Diné Republic. And Diné is a very famous tribe in the modern world. And I think that's just about everything geographically that we've explored okay. so far. Gotcha. And when you say, because you mentioned earlier about like expanding, are you talking about like when Coyote, Coyote and Crow, the setting that's already been created expands? Or are you talking about um, the discussion that we've had so far in terms of, you know, um, like... So there's a, there's a very little more I can tell you about it, but I did mean when the setting itself expands. Gotcha, okay, that makes sense, okay. I, because most of what we know so far is about moccasin, and more than moccasin, it's about Cahokia and the Freelands. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so for for right now, we have you have we have parts of Canada, you know, the the continental U.S., and then 
some of S- S- Central and South America? Or is that still kind of like, we've mentioned it, but we don't really have any kind of solid information regarding... Oh, and thank you for the follow, Dark Aster. Dark Aster? Dark H- Yeah, that... I'm horrible at pronouncing names. I apologize. But we see you. Thank you for following. Uh, but so the those have been fleshed out or not quite yet? in this. Not story? quite yet. Okay, okay. There's been a little bit fleshed out about the Ezkin Empire, which does expand into Central America. And we know the name of the lands of Central and Southern America. Okay. But we don't know much more than that about them yet. Gotcha. And I say, you know... Uh, we don't know, just in the official sense. Every story yeah. guide is free to come up with whatever they like, of course. Totally. Um, but no one is arc welding a meta plot to this game here. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, we know a little bit, and we've been talking about some ideas for the future, but haven't uh, gone into too much about it. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think I think as a rule, leaving things more, more open, um, tends tends to be a good thing. Um, I I think that you know it's it's helpful to have guidelines, but having things really specific, I think, you know, it tends to either make people follow them or make people completely ignore them. There's not really a middle ground with that, so. And. Uh... People do like to tell their own stories, and at its heart, Coyote and Crow is a storytelling game. It is a big, sweeping narrative. It encourages players to uh, tell their own story because it really is trying to kind of capture and update the classic indigenous style of story. Um, You know, the old tales like um, Red Shield... Um, Wolf Mother uh, trying to tell the old stories like um, all the native stories that most people don't know in America because of course not um, and yeah awesome well that, that that helps I mean there you know there are a lot of names a lot of things we discussed but that at least gives kind of a a geographical kind of understanding of what's going on what's been at least mapped out to a degree um within the within the current setting as it stands now which which i think is helpful because one of my questions was going to be i i wonder i was wondering like oh well like how how much um outside of the you know the continental us is actually you know has any kind of lore you know it'd be interesting as as it expands to like see what would happen in you know yeah, I mean South America, like the, the closest example, or across the break straight into Russia, you know, and see how those cultures have kind of, you know, um, done different things from being isolated differently than the real world. But maybe that's not, maybe that's I mean, you know, that gets into a whole thing and be like, okay, what what would Russian culture have become? And that's a whole other thing. And you know, uh, you know, maybe that's not the plan, but. So, Connor, the man who created the game, definitely has his own headcanon and ideas for uh, what's come, I think. Yeah. What happens out there, but it's going to be a little while before we get there. Like, we've got other places we want to visit first. Totally. Um, because there's plenty of games that explore uh, European culture. There's plenty of games that explore... Um, even Eastern European culture. Yeah. There's plenty of things that give us looks into how those would have developed in other settings. And we really want to focus on um, the indigenous Americas. That um, makes tons of sense. So with all the geography sort of explained, do you have any other questions on that? Yeah, I mean, um, it would be cool because uh, honestly, I don't have that great of a memory when it comes to your names, especially things that are, you know, more forward to at least myself. Um, I would love to go through and, and, you know, talk about those regions and talk about kind of what makes them unique and kind of dive a little bit more like deep uh, into them. Um, you know, because I, I think 
it, it, it kind of informs, you know, where maybe you start in the story, depending on like what you're what you want the campaign to look like. You know, I'm sure informs where you want to start and where your characters Absolutely. are familiar with. Um, thus far, we know a little bit about each place, okay. um, but most of what's been um, detailed so far is focused primarily on Cahokia as the trade city. It's a great jumping off point. Yeah, well, um, let's start there. I think that's a, a great place to start there. I'm going to, I am going to get back to Cahokia in just a minute because okay, I okay. want to do the others first okay. because there's so less known about them. No, 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 okay. That actually makes more sense. <laughs> Yeah, that way we can work up to Cahokia. Okay. So awesome. Um, the Tiswak Alliance are kind of uh, that's up in the Pacific Northwestern region. That's where the majority of those tribes uh, kind of came together, and you still have real world tribes existing in this world. Yeah. You have new ones. You have offshoots. You have um, all manner of things that never got a chance to exist in our world because and this is crucial um 700 years ago there was what's called the awis um which is a word that means the darkest night or the darkening uh purple tinged the night sky and a streak flew across it a comet struck the world and the world got a whole lot darker mm. the seas raged the ice shelf started creeping down almost overnight there was devastation untold the world itself tried to kill everyone um survive tribes banded together or were wiped out entirely uh, plenty of tribes took it this time to go next door to their suffering neighbors and um settle some old grievances but it's been almost 700 years and although the period has kind of uh the world's kind of gone up and down at several points for the most part it was still incredibly hard to survive mm. as culture as a people and it created some really interesting technology because more than technology the awis brought to this world the adonati which is these purple lines or stains on plants animals people um they have all of these glowing purple lines or rather purple lines that will glow on occasion okay because it was discovered with time and science that a person could take some animal dna they could take some of this adonity and they could inject themselves with it oh. they could essentially use that to become one with the animal in question and this is considered this is taking your path um gotcha okay. if you do it with a buffalo you can get a bit stronger a bit tougher everyone who takes the adonati which is most people um they get a little bit stronger a little bit mm. faster a little bit tougher they live a little longer some yeah. people develop active active powers supernatural abilities based around the um the animal they were associated with the path they were on now that's in the relatively recent past that we figured that out but to get there required some of the most ingenious thinking and the most ridiculous um, solutions to some of the problems that arose we're still seeing the uh ramifications of that because just in the last 50 years the world has started to kind of calm down okay the seas have calmed the ice shelf is slowly receding and moccasin is slowly becoming safe and habitable once more now, what this means is that 
no longer is the world so deadly. No longer are people at the throats of their neighbors because, of course, the nation states have been to war several times. Um, about a hundred years back, there was what was called the All Tribes War. Okay. And. You, sorry, you said a hundred years back. Yes. Okay. Okay. And so, just so I I understand the timeline is, um, the the whist happened about seven hundred years ago. A wisp with an A. A wisp. Yes. Okay. A W I S. Okay. Uh, and that happened seven hundred years ago, and that yes. that kind of accounts for some of the magical elements, and that accounts for you know some of these fantastic things that we don't have in our world, and kind of like is kind of like the byproduct is like maybe some of the creatures that we fight, what accounts for some of the danger. Ah, don't get ahead of me. Oh, okay, yes. okay, 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 yeah. <laughs> because in the past 50 years, everything's gone not quite back to normal, but it's gotten a lot better. Gotcha, okay. And what that means is that we now have this unchecked technolo technological spiritual growth that was needed to survive, and we don't need it to survive. Mm. We are now looking at a world that's slowly starting to get back on its feet. And it has all this technology. It has everything needed to survive a harsh climate that doesn't exist anymore. So what does a society do with that? Yeah, I, I've always really liked that concept of like, where you have technology moving faster than any kind of regulation or, you know, sophisticated mm -hmm. impl implementation and just like, you know, whatever kind of power structures in place, you know, can't keep up with things that are outside, you know, the technology. And, you know, typically it's more of like a, like a, like a, a like far, far future kind of thing. Um, but no, I, I, I think it's, it, that's super, super interesting where it's like you have this technology that grew from this kind of conditions that are no longer applying. And what does that do to the world because of that? I, I love that. And, from that, we get to a place where Cahokia and its neighbors, um, the Tiswak Alliance and the Diné Republic and the Ezkin Empire and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, they don't always get along. They're not in open war, but the simplest treaty could start an incredible chain of events that results in the next all tribes war. Gotcha. And that's what we're kind of worried about because our players are stepping into this world that is full of promise and hope and see that there's almost nothing in the wilderness because of course there's not for 650 mm. years nothing but the strongest survived mm. Yeah, no, I, I honest, uh, I think that's super interesting to have, like, the place that you kind of enter in this, this world is a place where, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not coming in like 50 years ago where there's like these wars and like, that's just what has to, you know, you're kind of forcing events, but just having this kind of period of calm and then allowing the person who's telling the story to really kind of move it in whatever direction they mm -hmm. want. I think, I think that's, that, that's that's really cool and then you know you could kind of have whatever history you want from you know 50 years ago 50 years ago is not like that's not that's not no, an insignificant period of time but there's still effects of that that are going to be you know rippling in the world and yeah that, that's honestly that's super cool I really, I really really like that and with how fast technology moves it can be a seem like a lot more time because you know, technology is moving at an ever-increasing rate in the real world, and it's moving even faster in Coyote and Crow. Yeah. So, 50 years is a huge difference. Oh, like 50 years ago, I mean, there's so many things that, yeah, I mean, 50 years astronomical in terms of technology, especially, you know, where we're at now, thinking about something that's, Versus that's 1970. accelerated. Oh, 1970. Oh, man, like, that's insane. Like to think right? of like what we're missing if we just teleport, if we just all snapped our fingers and we all went back to 1970, all the things that we'd be missing that we use 
every single day is just mm -hmm. absolutely insane. And the thing about, okay, take that, but like multiplied by an even higher number and then have that be like where the technology's at and just be like. <laughs> there you go. That's because, so cool. uh, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. It is insane the amount of technological differences and it's going to be a wider gap in this world. Um, yeah. But that is how it stands uh, kind of technology wise. I'll get back into that okay. in just a minute. Yeah. But so the different uh, nation states, each one is made up of kind of different tribes and different uh, people and Kohoki is a little different. It is so diverse. It is a situation where um, anyone can become a citizen in Kohokia. Either okay. they're born there or they spend two winters doing community service. Okay. And so long as they do that, you have all the rights as if you were born there. You have everything you could ever desire. Um, and Cahokia really is a post-scarcity society as presented here. Um, no one goes hungry in Cahokia. No one goes hungry. And you end up with uh, this world that is just so alien because of it because of the lack of capitalism. And that is just, it's amazing how much that affects everything. Yeah. Is, so again, forgive, forgive my ignorance, but so there's, there's like no, there's not capitalism in any of its like forms or any kind of uh, way, like how to, I guess. There's an economy, but it's not worshiped. Yeah, 100%. Um, there are things called Nizi, okay. and that's Nizi with a Z. That refers to units of currency. Okay. And it's roughly equivalent to, you know, one Nizi equals one dollar, kind of. Okay. Um, but uh, it's not even paper money anymore. In the world of Coyote and Crow, it was said a long time ago that paper money was unsanitary. So they just switch everything over to digital. Yep. Uh, people out in the boonies will still use it, but they still use uh, other things too. So, Okay. So question, just random thing, but like adventuring, right? You know, you're, you're out doing your thing or whatever. Typically in D&D, it's like you find gold. So, like, you know, would the equivalent be, like, you find, like, you know, like, a hard drive with, like, crypto, like, cryptocurrency in it? Or is it, like, you find paper money? Do you, like, hack so, a terminal or, like? Um, you can, okay. but that's not typically what you're after. Gotcha, okay. Most but... of the time, the uh, goal is based very heavily on the narrative being told, but... Um, what you're saying is actually really relevant to the discussion about experience because mm. CNC doesn't have traditional experience. Okay. When you create your character, you create a short-term goal and a long-term goal. That's right. Now, if you create a short-term goal, that is something you can do today. And knowing that... Um, if you manage to complete that goal, you can add a skill point to your sheet. If you complete a long-term goal, you can learn an ability, you can add a stat point, you can do all manner of things just because it represents how you've grown as a person. And Coyote and Crow really wants to reward that kind of creative thinking. Mm. So there's not like leveling up in like the, the, the traditional no. sense, okay. Not as such, no. Yeah. Uh, I, I like that too. I think, you know, for, for, for me, one of the hardest things about entering in D&D &D 
on on this channel was getting away from viewing it like a video game where you have yeah you know a victory you have a, a thing and you know it's a very you know western concept that you know just like the idea of doing it without it was very foreign to me you're like oh like you know you're not we're not trying to get gold like we're not like you know we're not trying to just get get the stuff you know it's, it's interesting you just how much like that mindset that like capitalistic mindset just like seeps into kind of so much of your thinking even even in like a fantasy setting and it influences oh, how you think about your character and how you you play your character too so a 100 percent and having that be different is just such a departure from settings it can it's honestly a little difficult to write for but mm. it's difficult in a good way it forces yeah. you to stretch your creative muscles like you're not just kicking down doors to find treasure, getting better gear, and repeating. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you've actually got to think, and the story guide has to tell you, has to give you a reason to want to be there. Like, why are you here instead of back at home, uh, you know, doing something? Doing something safe, presumably. <laughs> You know, because one of the one of the one of the easy the easy tropes you can do with like adventuring is like, oh, they're paying you. That's why you're doing it. <laughs> like, you know, which is a really easy way to tell a narrative. But if you if, yeah, if that if that's not what drives the people that are that are in the story, then you gotta have. And then, how, do you, uh, is it difficult to like? Because obviously, you know, with like D and D, right? You can have people with vastly different backgrounds and experiences, but money could always be a motivator, you know, to a degree. I mean, some more, some others. But to have everyone have this cohesive goal and be like, "Why are we here together?" rather than just like, "Because we're coworkers and we're being paid to," like, does that? I mean, does that often come up in terms of like, or is you kind of? hand wave a little bit more and be like okay like you know we're on this adventure just kind of have your character be okay kind of thing or is that so you can definitely hand wave it like a lot of groups either have or are made up of suyata and the suyata are roughly equivalent to uh federal marshals okay they are officers of the established government that operate largely under their own oversight and they report directly to the council of 12 who rule all of Cahokia. Okay. Um, they're not perfect by any stretch of the imaginations, sure. but a lot of characters are encouraged to have at least one in their group um, just because they are also really useful to have, not just for the players, but for the narrative. Hmm. Well, why are we here? You're helping the Suyata. Uh, yeah. Or you are a Suyata. You've been ordered here. It's, yeah. So, first sessions can be a little difficult, but yeah. second sessions, not so much. Sure. And I mean, there's always the kind of like, you know, the kind of hand wave, be like, you know, there's, <laughs> I've been in some groups where I'm like, honestly, my character would really have no reason to like follow these people, which, you know, Kyle would be like, well, then you shouldn't, should, shouldn't follow them. I'm like, well, we're kind of all here so you know there's 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 got to be like some compromise like you make a character that would hate all the other characters you're like okay come on like we are supposed to play together like let's compromise yeah this isn't vampire yeah. nor is it in coyote and crow either um there's a lot of room for character conflict especially yeah. between players but at the end of the day you are kind of encouraged to not only play together um there are some subtle encouragements to play uh not even as heroes but at least as moral people just because of the setting differences okay which i think is a really important distinction between this and more mainstream games that that, that it kind of encourages you to be like morally well, it spends because it's such a different culture and it's based on a completely different cultural mindset. Yeah, it is. It does spend quite a lot of time talking about um, morality and how that plays into it and what some of the differences are. 
Hmm. Like, like differences, like how? Like, like what uh, you might consider not that bad could be exceedingly taboo gotcha. in Cahokia or vice versa. Like in Cahokia, there is no um, cultural taboo against nudity. Okay. Um, and meanwhile, grave robbing is considered about the worst thing you can do. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And is is that something that you that like the, the spirit guide? Is that was it the, the the story guide? The story guide. Oh, the story guide. Okay. The story guide kind of will go over and you know talk about. I mean, maybe not like in the minutia, but kind of like an over kind of. Yeah. yeah, that's encouraged, and I tend to be doing that like constantly as I run myself, just because. I want to make sure that everybody is getting it and able to engage. Yeah. Because what's the fun if you can't? Like, you're going to hang around and watch all your friends have fun. That that doesn't sound like fun to me. That sounds... Yeah. Like, boring. Or a really bad orgy, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or well, it's like one of those things where, you know, you could have a player that just, you know... Because the, because the setting and just the whole thing is so foreign that they're they feel discouraged from you know trying different things and you know being more engaged in the story because of it you know whereas like you know typically you know D is very eurocentric in terms of like it's it's kind of oh, like absolutely. medieval but with magic and like i mean there's some things that kind of change when you add magic but like the culture overall doesn't really change that much from like you know, the Middle Ages kind of like. Which is know, a real idea. missed opportunity. Because so many settings have been just rife with uh, differences, and we're not seeing any of that. Yeah. It's it's almost like uh, people writing it decided, eh, they're white, that's good enough. <laughs> just default, default. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the, the default setting for, you know, things, and then, you know, you change a little bit, and you know, but you don't, yeah. really, you don't really change the the core of what it is. You don't change core values. You don't change entertainment. You don't change uh, whether or not people have ability to access al alcohol or that sort of thing. Yeah. You might change, like, mechanics and, like, magic systems and things, but that, yeah. that doesn't change the culture. That doesn't change the feel. It might change some of the mechanics and stuff. It's it's kind of crazy because I, I just like thinking back of like all like the kind of fantasy stories that I've even like read in like the kind of the BDI I've been exposed to and thinking about like what we're talking about in terms of you know yeah I mean it's cool and it's a different story because the magic system's different but for the most part they don't really explore like that much of a difference in culture they don't really explore like that much of a difference in values and that kind of thing. And focus more on like, oh, like the magic and the things that make it different from like our world, but like in the medieval setting. So it is. I, yeah. I just kind of thought about that. I'm like, I really can't think of very many, which is kind of sad. That's because there aren't very many. Yeah. Um, almost all the big settings are practically interchangeable, yeah. uh, with very little exception. Um, a story that takes place in Greyhawk can take place in Greyhawk, Dragonlance, uh, Planescape, um, and and uh, it almost doesn't matter, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the the or the differences are negligible. Yeah. Like, at most, you're going to change the magic, and it really doesn't matter where you end up, because it's going to be more of the same. It's going to be the same story. It's going to be the same uh, set of characters. Plucky young adventurers. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are, there are some things where you have, like, you know, the different races of characters kind of influence the culture. But, like, but those are kind of, I mean, unless you really change it based on like the default kind of thing that's that's set out in the lore of like, you know, D and D, like 
like dwarves and this you like really change dwarves they're kind of gonna be the same kind of regardless of the setting you know maybe like they're skinned a little bit differently but not not enough to be like unrecognizable from dwarves or, yeah you know, and uh or others think about the last time we saw a real shakeup in like the major fantasy races when was that dark sun I I, uh, uh, I don't even know what Dark Sun is, honestly. <laughs> so. Ah, the youth of this day. Uh, uh, it's an older setting. Um, right. It might be getting an update soon. They did give it an update in 4th Ed. But um, even then, everything was different because it was a desert world. Okay. Uh, so it was very brutal. It was very uh, unforgiving. Um, but it was very different, yet you could still see that it was just your normal fantasy races by and large yeah. with a little bit of a change. Whereas this is totally different. Yeah. And honestly, that's what it's like. Um, it's, it, it feels Invisible hard to book. like quantify in my own brain just because it, it feels so like for it and just like trying to even think about things that like think about that i can like can like connect to and kind of correlate and and yeah think about that oh it's so foreign native americans are so foreign like isn't that is so a little sad. bit twisted Fuck, it's like ah oh, like yeah it's bad it's really bad that's because the culture was not allowed to thrive in fact quite the opposite and that's part of what makes this game so important yeah it's part of why we need something like it um and natives have been needing this for uh a long time or yeah. well they've been needing a lot but you know a minor thing like this and regardless it's uh it can only help um, but to get back to what we were talking about yeah. is, um, so I want to talk a bit about the technology level in Moccasin. Okay. That it's, um, you were talking about solar punk and it is, it's very, very solar punky. Mm. Um, you use clean energy. Uh, you've got solar energy, you've got hydroelectric energy, you've got things um, that they just developed so differently. Like um, like I said, there are no firearms, but people do still use traditional bows. You also use what's called mag bows, which are kind of interesting. Um, I remember you mentioning them uh, last week. Yes. Time. So rather than uh, power a projectile with um, a directed explosion, you do the same thing with fluctuating magnets, essentially, mm -hmm. that just rocket out uh, an arrow incredibly fast. You know, we're talking sub-sound speeds here. Oh, and, shoot. like, then we've got, um, but even that's, that's perfectly valid. We also have what's called mag slings, which are the same idea, and they're a little more analogous to handguns. Um, there are just these little slings, and they use magnetic force to propel um, bullets, and it's amazing. Um, beyond that, we also have the yutsu, which are which are public transportation, essentially. Uh, Yutsu barges, Yutsu... Uh, Yutsu... Trains, for lack of a better term. Um, which are these maglift vehicles that skim along the ground and um, are essentially powered almost by the Earth's magnetic field and gravity. Oh. Again, no fossil fuels, no... Yeah. Uh, so you had to come up with something very different. We also have um, sun wings, which 
are called that because they run off of solar energy and they are small personal um flight craft essentially okay like a like something like the like um shoot what's it called not a not a parasail is that the one i think or is it more compact um a little like a parasail with a cockpit okay so it it is like a full vehicle and less like yes. a like a pen yes. kind. Of, okay, gotcha. But it is still kind of shaped like a uh, a parasail. Okay. Um, but you've got that, and there are so many things that are just done with magnets. That it's ridiculous. Right. Um, well, it looks like Jade is actually here, so I don't know if we want to take just a quick. Um, I think maybe we take it just a quick five minute break and we just get things sorted out and maybe get her up to speed. I am good. And we can swap out. Thank you so much for uh, everything. I'm really looking forward to hearing more and honestly see what kind of questions Jade has for you too. But thank you. And um, so we will adjust to a break in just a sec and um, we will catch you guys in a minute. All right. And welcome back once more to the Untitled Coyote and Crow Talk Show. Uh, with me now is the lovely Jade Valkyrie joining us, and I can't wait to get back to talking about it. Uh, did you have anything in particular you wanted to know about moccasin today, Jade? Oh, that's hard because there's, yeah, there's just literally so much. I know that earlier in our little catch up, you were talking about how, I guess, the geopolitical landscape of that. Um, so, of course, me, I'm always thinking in terms of content creation, or not content creation, character creation. Sorry, I have a cat that literally ruined my entire train of thought. Um, but, yeah, in terms of character creation, um, I think that um, it'd be important to... If you, have you gotten to the specifics about each uh, nation state? Such as we know, um, we don't know very much, and I didn't actually get to go into a lot of that, so I will double back. Because cool. um, I'm thinking, what are, like, because these could be potential places that our characters could be from, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, within Makasing. It's a little harder once we get down to Abayang and, Abiz and Abayang and Azayang, which are central and south america mm -hmm. but yeah. <laughs> that'd be a lot that'd be an entire stream in itself <laughs> yes and uh we haven't quite gotten there within the setting yet for that matter we know they exist and we know their names we don't know a whole lot else about them um what we do know are cahokia which is the nominal um capital of the Freelands, and the Freelands are called that because they're kind of wilderness. They are, um, there are definitely trails and accepted paths, but there's a lot that happens in the Freelands about which people just don't know. Um, it comprises the majority of like the Midwest, everything north and south of it basically, until we get down to the Ezkin Empire, which is Texas uh, and some of Central America. And the Ezkin Empire is kind of exactly what it sounds like. It is um, this place where it's an empire. Everyone within it is taken care of. Everyone within it has the highest quality of life in Moccasin. But Ezkin Empire's um, line of thought is we will all have peace when we are all beneath the Ezkin Empire classic entire stuff <laughs> yeah now um the pacific northwest is taken up by the tiswak alliance which is made up of all the tribes that were there initially and they uh they honestly kind of go head to head more with cahokia than most of the others do um and why kind of really hasn't been talked a whole lot about but they are um they're a bit of a looser a looser state although they're probably the most diverse after cahokia itself because like i was saying earlier anyone can come to cahokia all that takes to naturalize is spending two summers volunteering within the city and then you have all the rights as if you were born here um 
above the Tiswak Alliance, we have the Haudenosaunee Confederation. And I say above, but really it is um, what we would think of as south of it, because that is, um, it's in the area around California, and that is much looser. The government there is a little more hands-off. It's a little more, uh, life there is just a little bit harder um, because of a couple of reasons about which I'm not going to get too far into, but they're really fun. Um, we also have the uh, Diné Republic, which uh, takes its name from, of course, the real world tribe, the Diné. And they are run by various, they have many smaller cities, essentially, each of which are run by councils. So they like to think of themselves as a little bit better than Cahokia because they've taken that model and I don't want to say mass produced it, but they have kind of Made taken it, it widespread and, and shrunk yeah. it and made it a bit more, uh, yeah, widespread. And after that, we have, um, and that is in the area around Louisiana and Florida. And after that, who have I not gone into specifically? Because I am missing someone. Uh, the Kitawagi Federation, I actually got it wrong. They're the ones that are um, in the area of Florida and Louisiana. And they... We don't know a whole lot about them just yet. Um, they are a little bit further from, uh, they're a little bit further outside of the narrative right now. Mm -hmm. Mostly so far, the main book focuses on Cahokia and to a lesser extent, the Freelands. But Cahokia is its own city state in and of itself. Like I said, it is nominally uh, the capital of the freelance, but that's very nominal just because it's located inside and it's a prominent trade hub. But people from all over Moccasin make the journey to Cahokia for reasons of their own, um, mostly to do with trade and things like that. Uh, and some lesser uh, pleasant reasons, of course. Now, Yeah, I think that's about it. Um, right now, since the All Tribes War, about 100 years back, we've got uh, relative peace because life was really hard. The world was trying to kill everyone and there were bigger fish to fry when, you know, everyone wasn't actively trying to kill everyone else. But now, now that it's been 100 years or so and... The world has been calm for about 50 years. Uh, people are starting to explore more. And that means these places are coming head to head a lot more often. Old treaties that were thought to be inviolable are getting trod upon and in some cases outright broken. And old, old hatreds are starting to flare back up which in a world that's had this vast, rapid technological expansion is a recipe for some dangerous stuff. Um, and that's putting aside the fact that the more the earth settles, the more that various other things are starting to creep out of the shadows, things out of legend, things out of nightmares, and things that have never been thought of before are all possible to be discovered within uh, the realm of Moccasin. Wow. So I have two questions. First question is that, so, because all of these sound so unique and diverse, are there any things that, like, it, I guess, if you were, say, bonuses or, like, suggested uh, benefits from being from each category, like, let's say, like, you were from the Empire, then? It might be suggested that you take something. Um, are those uh, in in any sort of way, or is that just up to the player? 
Um, right now, that's really up to the player. Uh, there isn't any kind of um, mechanical bonus to being from anywhere. Uh, there are a lot more about these places in the book itself. And um, you would definitely want to read it because... <laughs> yeah, definitely. Couldn't really give like a t TLDR of like an entire you know, right. nation state. Uh, but it's good to entice people be like, oh, your character could be from here. Your character could be from there. They could travel from here to there. Yeah. From there to here. Because uh, with the Yutsu technology, the trains, the barges, it's mm -hmm. uh, travel between them is definitely possible. Not always nice, but uh you could do it <laughs> you could do it and there's a lot that i didn't go into like uh the Dene is a lot more spiritualistic than cahokia and the um teeth walk are a little more adventurous and a little more keen to send out expeditions uh and the teeth walk have this almost caste system but Again, I think it's really important for most people to read this particular section because they are each so diverse and I really want people to experience it for themselves. That is, that, that yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's kind of the point. We want people to, you know, grab that book for themselves and dive right in. Um, we're just giving you a little, a little taste, a little snippet. But mm -hmm. um, before we close out, are there any anything else about the setting that you're just dying to tell the chat that we haven't gotten to yet? Oh, we still have a little while before we need to uh, close out, but... Oh, cool. <laughs> it, yeah, we still have a whole other hour. Oh, nice. <laughs> I did not know that. Because cool. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm definitely here for it. We said, yes, we still have a whole other hour. Um, now... There was, I'm actually going to go back to the beginning and talk a little more about the Awis because that happened 700 years ago before the start of the uh, setting. And it really is the branching point. It is when the world changed. It happened in um, around the year... 1400 ish uh as we reckon time but in one night everything was different it went from normalcy to the world shaking the seas boiling ice creeping as you can watch it and survival didn't just wasn't just hard it was damn near impossible in some cases a lot of tribes only survived because they came together and formed these um these nation states these these federations and confederacies and it's it's such a different diverse setting that i i really think it's important that uh not only do I think the entire game is important, I think the setting's uniqueness is in how it deals with the changes that happened and what might be the same. Um, but, like, what else do you want to know, Jade, or anyone in the chat? Um, hmm. We talked about the individual nations. We talked about... Um, transportation we talked about um have you gotten into detail about moccasin that's the that is that the main city or is that cahokia that's cahokia moccasin okay. is what the... um is north america gotcha. the contiguous what we think of as the contiguous united states and um cahokia itself is as I've said before, it's a trade city and it is incredibly diverse. Um, it is so easy to, well, I don't want to say it's easy, but they make immigration simple. Come help us for two years and we'll help you the rest of your life. And 
as I've touched on already, it's not a capitalistic society. They have money, but everyone has enough one way or another. Um, no one goes ho hungry on the streets of Cahokia. No one uh, has to worry about being thrown out and freezing to death on the streets. It's a lot more community minded and it's a lot more family minded. Um, most homes have people who, most homes have three or more generations living together because of the expanded lifespan. And it's just, it is, everything in Cahokia comes down to family, if you want to get right down to it. Um, the restaurants are family oriented. It's expected that while, while uh, solo dining is not like insanely rare, it is pretty rare. It doesn't happen often um, because when the idea is you come into this restaurant, you are essentially stepping into the chef's home and you are joining him for dinner is the idea. So you tend to have uh, one of a couple of setups, one of them being this long uh, singular table and you come and you join and you eat what's already been prepared. Or it's a matter of you have these separate, you have booths or areas that are intended for families to come together on their own and even even the act of um because restaurants also serve as a form of healing it's it's considered medicine you come you share a meal with your family you enjoy their company you enjoy the warmth both physical and spiritual emotional of having that shared experience with your family and it's it's a prescribed part of recovery in a lot of cases um like another part of recovery is often a comedian the best comedians in cahokia perform in hospitals they are attached contracted if you want to say it to perform in the city's hospitals because they're considered another necessary part of the healing process. Um, they said laughter is the best medicine. That ain't changed here. It's amazing how much better you feel after a really good joke. Beyond that, Cahokian culture focuses a lot on the idea of personal and collective responsibility, I want to say. Mm -hmm. You are responsible for your own actions, but you have to think about how they affect everyone around you, not just your family, but literally everyone around you, because no man is an island unto themselves, and the city of Cahokia is no different. If you face a punishment under the Cahokian legal system, while they don't punish your family, it is kind of a slight against them. It's almost considered an insult by your family because why would you, why would you bring this upon us too? You reflect on us, we reflect on you. Um, actually, that does bring us to the Cahokian legal system, doesn't it? Yeah. So, within Cahokia, if a crime is committed, it tends to go before a trial. And if you're found innocent, that's kind of the end of it. If you're found guilty, you're given a sentence, and you are told how this can be reversed. How this sentence can be reversed. What can you do to fix it? What can you do to cure it? Um, other than that, after, the, after that, there's a second trial that's held. And the judge will either rule in agreement with the first and 
in which case the sentence is carried out or he will rule against. And if that's the case, then it goes to a third trial for a tiebreaker, essentially. And a lot of things can happen. Um, one of the big ones that can be handed down from judges, the biggest that individual judges can hand down is um, removal of your citizenship. You are stripped of your title as a citizen. You cannot gain money. You uh, have to pick a place to serve your time. Um, upwards, of, it could be as much as 20 years if it's a serious enough offense. But you usually end up helping in uh, either guard barracks or the fields. You're fed, you're taken care of, but that's it. You are not allowed um, personal freedoms and you are made to help the betterment of the city. There is one worse punishment. And actually, but when your uh, punishment is over, it's like it never happened. Ah, uh, so you do get your citizen citizenship back after. You do, yes. Um, there's a big ceremony and the person you aggrieved is given the chance to physically embrace you. Most people take it to officially welcome you back to uh, to Cahokia. To welcome you back to society, essentially. And... And that has, like, no bearing on, like, their... I mean, nope. of course, like, their... Not even the other people, so it just... As literally as is, nothing happened afterwards. Well, it's supposed to be in the way of people, Ideally. you know. <laughs> in the way of people. Yeah, you can't like this. The state can't be like you don't remember anything, but they can have a culture of forgiveness. Yes, and that's what it is. It is a culture of forgiveness. Inevitably, you're going to have people who aren't happy with it or think it should have been a harsher punishment, but. Um, like I said, most people choose to take the hug, so, um, and there is one harsher punishment that's part of the Cahokian legal system, and that's banishment. You are put out of Cahokia, and you are no longer welcome there. When that happens, you are everything, um, essentially, it's an extended death sentence people aren't really supposed to talk about you anymore um, just because it's considered painful like you don't talk about the dead because they're banished they're nothing they don't exist we will never see them again um, and when you're banished you're usually allowed to go your own way and do your own thing um, until you die in the wilderness because like I said there's still wilderness out there but if you're especially bad, if you were, the crime you were accused of is especially heinous, you can earn a Suyata detail of your very own to watch you until the end of your days to make sure that you go nowhere near Cahokia. Or, well, Cahokia would never hand down a death sentence. Understand. But if a banished person were trying to injure Cahokians or uh, cause trouble, there's a big wilderness out there. Lots of caves. Things could happen. Accidents happen all the time. Which, actually, I'm going to talk about the Suyata next. Um, yeah, the that was Suyata. my next question. I was just like, so there's this person that is that their main job is just to follow these banished people around so wouldn't that make them also banished but i guess if it's their third job then there might be an end point to that but oh yeah they're rotated out okay <laughs> um so the suyata are a part of the legal arm of cahokia they are equivalent to uh federal marshals essentially there's very little oversight to what they do um a lot of it is assumed that they are going to use their powers for the good of society. 
um, they report directly to the Council of Twelve, the ruling body of Cahokia. That is their oversight. Anything they do reflects on the council. And individual council members have like their favorites that they will call upon most of the time. They can basically have pet Suyata. Um, and a lot of player characters do end up going the Suyata route just because they are um, just because they are really fun. Um, so the Suyata is a uh, it's a word that means chosen. And to become one, you've got to be vetted. You've got to be go through some intense physical and mental training. Um, and of course, not every Cahokian trusts them. Even the constables, the rank and file law enforcement, don't trust the Cahok don't trust the Suyata. Um, you can really definitely end up. You can still end up with a. Uh, this is my jurisdiction problem between the two <laughs> organizations. Now, technically speaking, the Suyata outrank them, but do you really want to piss off the constables? Not really. <laughs> now, earlier I called uh, Kohokia a post-scarcity society, and it really is. Um, it's developed sustainable ethical farming practices. It focuses mostly on clean energy. Um, and it's got a robust, forgiving legal system. There are still criminals. They still happen. There's still a... Actually, so... Another big thing in the last 50 years is the invention of what are called GATs. GATs. And that is a Chahi word for something that is essentially a 3D printer. And they are cheap, they are effective, and just about anything can be made that's not organic, essentially. You can make, they can make clothes, they can make most items, they can make um, all the necessities of life. So with that, it's a lot of uh, what people, you know, need is much easier to obtain. There is still a market for the old, the custom, and the handmade because they're uh, cheaper 3D printers. You can't really make most custom things. Um, but if you break a bowl, it's not the end of the world. You just go and print out a new bowl. Um, and that's kind of where there ends up being a little bit of a black market um, because if you want older technology, if you want something handmade, custom, or associated with bad medicine, that's something you can't get in the market. You have to go through the right people. Um, So, like, in that system, are there, like, proper channels to get custom things as well as oh, yeah. improper channels to get custom For things? custom things, yes. Uh, for custom things, you have plenty of proper options for um, customizing and plenty of proper options for handmade things. Those things you can find in the market. What you can't find is the bad medicine and usually the older technology because technology moves much faster in Cahokia than it does in our world. Um, think about the difference between now and 50 years ago in America. Think about the difference between 100 years ago. And in Cahokia, anything that's more than five years old is practically out of date. You know, people walk around with Nisi, with an S, on their arms, which is like a cell phone plus, it's like a cell phone, if a cell phone met a pit boy and they had a baby. That's an easy. <laughs> um, everyone has them. They're not particularly difficult to get. They're 
pretty uh, inexpensive. They're considered a part of life. And again, if you need a new one, you can just go to the kitchen and print one. Um, now, if you want it special or you want it fancy, that you've got to go and buy elsewhere. But yeah, you just upgrades, the like. I'm sure that that's something you could do with like yeah. technology skills yep. or yes. And so, with like those technologies, is that also where the cybernetics come in? Yes, because of the in increase in technology levels um a lot of uh physical differences and uh a lot of unfortunate circumstances aren't really a factor in most people's lives there are uh cybernetic replaceable limbs and if you lose your arm you can just have a cybernetic replacement made if you um if you lose an eye you can have a cybernetic replacement made and they aren't you don't typically have to buy them um if you need it you need it and you get it it won't be special but it'll be functional it'll work um you won't take penalties for like, just mechanically speaking, within the rules of the game, it works well enough that you don't get penalties on any kind of die rolls. So it's assumed that it works at least reasonably close to it what it's replacing. Like, an eye may not see everything crystal clear, but it sees it clear enough. Yeah. Um, you might not be able to uh, do something fancy like turn to an infrared mode without getting something custom made, but... You'll see. Um, and within the society of Kahoki, if you decide you are just fine the way you are, then you're just fine the way you are. Because that's something else I haven't talked about. Um, within Kahoki, the full spend of spectrum of gender is accepted. Um, not just, you know, ma mask presenting and femme presenting, but also um two spirit identities are known and appreciated um if you happen to be trans no one cares if you happen to be uh if you're ace if you're arrow if you're anything that um western society has sort of uh sort of made problematic um no one cares um most tribes i don't want to say most but many tribes have the idea that um generally speaking the creator doesn't create people wrongly so how you are is how you were meant to be but they take that to mean if you're trans then you're trans and clearly that's the way you're supposed to be And so there's no discrimination for that within the city at all. That's the kind of thing that is uh, so alien to this mindset that you're probably not going to run into it ever. Um, and actually, uh, the um, not uh, the Diné Republic has a very important ruling body called the 12 which are made up of 12 two-spirit identity people that set policy they're considered incredibly important spiritual figures and so most people in Cahokia end up at least some form of spiritual atheists are a little weird not hated but they are a little weird they're they're rarer to see um just because it's usually accepted that there was a creator and they abandoned us mm. the awis happened and drove the creator away or the creator left and then the awis happened either way 
there are many schools of thought that suggest that the creator is no longer paying attention. Um, there are no judgments made about that. Like, oh, well, guess we're here now. Guess uh, Sky Daddy's not uh, looking in on us from time to time. Yeah. That sucks. But it is generally accepted that he exists, or they exist, or she exists. Yeah, I mean, that would be an interesting point of thought. Um, especially because of like how the um, paps are represented, things of that nature, um, mm -hmm. explaining those. Um, but of course, everyone is entitled to their own beliefs. So I love that that's in there, baked in there. Um, yeah, and the paths are based around some science that occurred. Oh, science. Okay. Yes, a little while back, uh, they discovered that if they took some DNA from a, an animal that had the Adonati um, upon them and mixed it with human DNA, that gave the human a longer lifespan. It gave them a bit more strength, a bit more endurance, and a bit more speed. It also increased uh, someone's lifespan which I already said, and some people, about 20%, end up with special abilities from the Adonati, all of whom are part of the player characters. Like, it is assumed <laughs> your character is one of these 20 special people. Well, I'm trying to decap myself, but while I do so, uh, so does that mean that, like, everyone undergoes this, or is there still a choice whether or not you uh, take this route? Oh my goodness. So, no technically speaking, this. there is in fact a, well, well, there is currently no path of the cat, uh, when you take your path, it is accepted that you become one with the animal in question. So, there you go. That's appropriate. <laughs> yes, because he was latching on. I need to clip his paws, but yeah, he's a ham. Um, but as soon as there's a path of the cat, I'm sure that um, that would probably end up being in a player character once in a while. He's basically now, on me all the time. And also these. <laughs> now, um, so, but yes, the uh, Adonati, most people end up taking it. It is technically a choice to not, mm -hmm. but we're talking 95% of people go through with it. Uh, I'm not going to draw. Mean, it's uh, like a life. <laughs> expectancy in this yeah. role improve your quality of life so. yeah there's literally no downside it's been around long enough that it's not like new or experimental it's an accepted fact of life um think of it more in line with like the oh jesus anything i say is going to end up depressing um like a vaccination yeah uh, I was going to say, think of it like the polio vaccine, but then I remembered like, oh, wait, there's an increasing number of people. And yeah. anyway, but yes, it is just accepted that most people will do it and most people do it. There's no reason not to. Um, now, the uh, Adonati, it's, it's a rite of passage when you turn 16 or some other age to be considered a legal adult for most purposes, um, you go through the Adonity. You pick your path. You basically go to a ceremonial place of science, spirituality, and say, I choose the path of X or path of Y. And thus is done every tribe have their own uh ascension rituals they've got their own celebrations their own uh their own things to mark the occasion but so that's completely up to the players um now personally when i run coyote and crow um i don't tend to describe ceremonies I don't tend to describe medicine because in a lot of native cultures, modern native cultures, it's not acceptable to describe um, such things. 
it's considered incredibly taboo, incredibly rude, and it's just not done. So I don't tend to do that. If the players want to describe it, that's on them. I make no choice. I just say there is a ceremony that is done. Um, but that's just uh, a little interesting tidbit about how I run games. Um, what other burning questions do you have about the setting? Okay, I'm just, I'm also just trying to think of like, what, what would a player character run into? So we talked about the legal system, talked about, uh, I guess, education. Um, that would be really important um, if that's uh, already been written upon. It has. Um, most, now everybody in Cahokia receives an education. Um, they receive, you know, a basic education. Growing up, it's expected that families are a bigger part of that. Uh, they may not necessarily go to a school for eight hours a day. There is a place of learning, um, but it's not, like, considered a child's job. It's a lot more organic. It's a lot more... Um, it's honestly reminded me a lot in the way they describe it. They remind me a lot of the Montessori a uh, way of learning where it's a lot more hands-on it's a lot more focused on tactile learning and learn by doing and organic learning go where the child wants to with their education um and as uh the citizens get older any trade they go into they can be apprenticed in they can get specialized training for what they want to do um the only kind of exception is like performance spaces, but even then you have the option of getting trained and learning from your elders and it's usually recommended and expected. And that is actually a huge part of Cahokia, respect for your elders. Mm -hmm. um, that they are alive longer than you, they must have gained some wisdom uh, whether or not that is accurate in the real world is not really relevant. Um, they are... The point is, within Coyote and Crow, you're supposed to listen to your elders. Um, now, do some of them abuse that? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, are there still abusive parents in Cahokia? You bet. Are there still toxic families? Oh yeah, 100%. It's not utopia, but it has removed a lot of things that um, poverty plays a big part in. Uh, crime happens, theft happens, um, but even when it does, the sentence might be give it back and spend a week helping him make more, you know? Yeah. Uh, or you are required to be the apprentice until the gat runs off three times the amount you uh, tried to take. Instead that of kind of thing. It's going to ruin your life completely. Yeah. <laughs> so. And if it's a particularly lenient judge, it might be, does they do they have it back? Don't do it again. Because at that point, what's changed? Nothing everybody's lost time that's it everything's done now go home let's not waste mine uh -huh. so and the legal system not everybody's happy with it uh some people think it's very fair of course and some people do still think that corruption runs pretty deep that what one person might see as leniency and understanding compassion someone else might very well still see as corruption like oh you only voted that way because you're both old families in Cahokia um, for that matter the Council of Twelve and I'm going to transition into that just because of that old family comment yeah. because initially the Council of Twelve was made up of representatives of the 12 most populous tribes in Cahokia but over the years that position has changed it's morphed. It's become um, a status symbol. It's become a mark of powerful families. This position can be inherited. 
it can be passed down. So you've got people who are there who have been uh, on ruling families for upwards of a hundred years at this point. Some people on the council are more than a hundred years old. People in Cahokia regularly live to 120 to even 150. <sighs> With a reasonably high quality of life. Because in Cahokia, it's sort of expected that when your grandparents get too old to take care of themselves, you will take care of them. Um, for that matter, if you are somebody who ha doesn't have a family for one reason or another, if you've lost your family, if you've been ousted from your family for some reason, there are um, communal places, lodges. Yeah. There are communal lodges which look a lot like apartment homes that you can go and well it's sort of expected that the people there become a makeshift family there are also supportive services that send you out a uh uh make sure you're not alone on the important holidays make sure you're fed you're cared for that kind of thing and they do it with as much dignity as can be had And if there's uh, any question about the stance of um, <laughs> uh, that one would have over certain procedures in Cahokia, that should sum it up quite nicely. I mean, if you're able to do a lot of things with your identity, mm -hmm. um, I figured that the most basic rights would be enabled for oneself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine how that, that, uh, wow, it's crazy. <laughs> but, uh, I guess we could talk if we were going to end to, uh, because we keep on talking about the medical benefits and the comedians being part of the medical system. It has the, is there more information about the general healing and medical? So, Practices? um, like, is there a place for that, or is it more widespread? Um, so, um, there are places for it. There are hospitals, there are medicinal mm -hmm. gardens. There's a lot of options when it comes to healing. Um, so, you know, how in real life we have, uh, you know, normal, normal hospitals, and you've got the homeopathic treatments, uh, and whether or not those work, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get into. Doesn't matter. Um, within Coyote and Crow, the homeopathic treatments are considered to at least be good um, for the soul. Like, oh, you believe this is going to help you? Then yes, bring it in, and we'll make it a part of your treatment plan. Um, so if your family is particularly traditional, and they say, oh. Um, we, you're sick, so we need to smudge you to cleanse you of uh, the spirits. That's allowed. That is considered a part of your treatment. And it's um, not looked down upon either. It's just no. a part. Yeah. It's just a part of your treatment. If nothing else, because it makes you feel better. Because and that's where it, those three stats come into mm -hmm. place, where you have your body, your mind, and your soul. And your soul. Yeah. And yeah. Because it's all one thing. To heal your body, you have to have your mind and soul healed too. Otherwise, you're never going to get fully healthy. Um, and obviously, again, there's mental health care widely available. Uh, if your treatment plan calls for something unusual, it's usually allowed. Like, so long as it's not like, oh, I'm going to stab myself in the eye three times or... <laughs> Well, actually, I mean, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm thinking but about it. Heal it, heal yeah, it up. they can. Um, I don't know if they can regenerate entire limbs, but I know they can cybernetically replace them. But if I actually don't know what the position of Cahokia would be on ritualistic sacrifice of a body part, because that happened in some native tribes. There are plenty of stories. Mm -hmm. Um 
usually it's something small, quote unquote, part of a finger, a finger and eye. But there are there are stories where people gave of themselves and their body to get some kind of power, get some kind of knowledge, wisdom, a vision. Um, and I suppose that might actually be, it would be dependent on the doctor in question. Uh, what your uh, Ekbalia says, um, you know, uh, like I suppose it would be a matter of weighing the benefits and cons in this case. <sighs> but, um, and if you, so your treatment plan would include a comedian if you had long-term care. Your treatment plan would include uh, probably going to the restaurant with your family. It would include um, a lot of things to help speed you on your recovery. And it's not that it doesn't cost anything, but everyone can pay one way or another. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not like, oh, yes, you're... Uh, and it's not like, oh, well, we'll keep you alive, but if you want to be healthy, you actually have to, no. Um, it's actual health care, not sick care. So, beyond that, uh, there are, um, robotic things in Coyote and Crow. Not many, they do exist. There are, um, Although, going the opposite direction from futuristic beings, there are folkloric beings. There are traditional Native American monsters that are available and statted up in the Coyote and Crow rulebook. Um, and they include not just, you know, the stats for fighting them, but a little bit of the lore behind them and how they're uh, portrayed and if necessary there's minor notes on what to do with them and there's some that you might expect in here that you're not going to find um, because if you're thinking about a certain W cannibal sky monster that a lot of us have heard stories about you won't find it in this book because you're not supposed to talk about it you're not supposed to write it down. So it's not there because it wouldn't be respectful. In, in adding it at all, you have already failed the respect test. Um, same for... It's just rule number one. The <laughs> same for uh, a certain Navajo thing. Um which I'm not going to say any more about, but that has entered the popular culture in some really unpleasant ways. And yeah, you won't find them, but you can find most things that are fine to talk about. Like a story that's been gaining popularity in recent years is the Deer Woman. She's in here. If you know some uh, classic stories, Ninian, the Stone Man is in here you've got various other native stories represented because the world of moccasin is so much more than just natives running around it's america decolonialized it's it really is an exploration of native culture in a fun new lens it brings native culture into the modern day and it um yeah it's just amazing um and like yeah i was very happy because i know there are certain stories my tribe tells and they're in here some things that feature in them um, and when I was first, uh, writing for them, I was incredibly excited because, um, 
well, I got to write my own story, which will be coming out very soon, um, mm -hmm. which I will be, I'm actually getting to play test it at Gen Con uh, very, very soon. So there will be more on that, but it was nice to see not just natives represented, but actual tribes, actual tribal lore, and the kind of tribal lore that's not, that wasn't, that's sourced ethically. Mm -hmm. So, what else can I tell you about this wonderful setting with get, getting into the weeds? Um, do you have any specific other questions for me at the moment, Jade? I'm more I'm a lot more curious about like the I guess supernatural entities I want to say always monsters but definitely some of the um, more supernatural elements of the world and of the I guess things that people might encounter um, and then maybe after that um, like a uh, because there is combat I know we're going to be talking about that later but mm -hmm. kind of like what would be some of the forces that players would have to come up against potentially in combat okay so um the monsters because a lot of them are monsters at least um as we think of them um they might have their in fact a lot of native cultures have the monsters have understandable reasons for existing they've got um a lot of them are symbols of something a lot of them are um anthropomorphizations of things uh not what mainstream culture would have you believe in a lot of cases because let's be honest does any culture need to be told that cannibalism is bad <laughs> i would i'd just say no most likely not um and the idea that something does is uh kind of insulting but these supernatural entities, they're called folkloric beings. When you come upon one, you can ask the ST, the story guide, for a role. And the role in question is, uh, is outlined in the descriptions themselves to get a little more oomph. But any story guide is encouraged to remember that this is a native game and tell it like a native story uh, to give it like a story that's been passed down in an oral tradition. Um, you never just want to sound like you're reading numbers off a page. That's, that's rule number one for role playing, but it's especially important here. <clears throat> and as far as combat, so combat, the things you can run up against, you can definitely run up against certain supernatural entities. Um, like if you want to go toe to toe with the stone man or the deer woman, you can. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> they can be defeated. Whether or not they can be killed, eh, that's difficult to say. Whether they're entire species or just one thing, that's really difficult to say. But, beyond that, you will also find um, people who have been uh, people you'll come up against for one reason or another. Uh, political ideologies, um, sociological identities. Um, you might encounter an enemy nation, representatives in your travels, in your excursions, and disagreements might ensue killing is considered wrong in general but something can be wrong and practical sure i might pay for this later but you won't be a problem anymore uh and you will also come up against um various criminal elements possibly legal elements if you go the opposite direction you will come up against um things both familiar and strange because this book includes a lot of native kinds of stories 
that you don't hear about in the popular culture. <laughs> You're also going to come up against various... Um, you're going to be confronted a lot with society's failures that are endemic to the human experience, regardless of how post-scarcity something is, regardless of uh, how, um, regardless of how wonderful society is. You're going to come up with problems that humans have to deal with one way or another. And a lot of it's just going to be, um, a lot of it is going to be conflict within your group, ide ideally, because your group's not always going to get along. And that's true no matter what we're talking about, but it's that kind of thing that I love role playing for most the deep deep conversations and coyote and crow gives us a fully immersive experience a fully immersive world that i have run comparatively few games to the other systems i've run before but almost every game in coyote and crow has had this intense ethical discussion in the story completely organically Something one of the players has said to another has led to talks about, is this right? Is this moral? Is this ethical? Should we do this? Um, what? Do we have another option? Um, I have never seen a game so... Combat is totally acceptable, but I have seen it lead to combat so many fewer times in this system that it's ridiculous. It really is just... It's presented as an option, but it's amazing what people will do to avoid it when it's not the only or the default option. Mm -hmm. I have seen some of my favorite people, some of my best friends who have played this game with me, um, who I know love combat suddenly turn into some of the most some of the most um prone to talk characters and it's just been great it is a completely different experience and i can't i can't talk about it enough um so are there any other questions that you want to know about whether cahokian society or other societies. I don't think so, but I'm just still in awe of just like, I guess the world and the environment itself. Um, I'm like, wow, I want to kind of go. I think that'd be pretty cool <laughs> to be there. Uh, oh, yes. Okay. So I'm like, I'm trying to wreck my brain because it's just also just so great. To it is really it. alien. It is, it is alien, but like in a great way. It's just because yeah. we haven't had something be, I guess, so good or so ideal that it is in itself like almost a fantasy setting because we haven't had something like that quite yet at the at a larger scale on like a big, big societal scale. So, wow. Um, let's see, role play. There was something I wanted to discuss there um, about role play in the setting. Um, uh, conflict resolution. Yes, um, conflict resolution. I think that was what it is. Because talking about that, like, and of course in the series, we're definitely drawing upon comparisons between this and D&D mm -hmm. &D 5e, where the society is more about like, we'll pay you 10 gold to kill these monsters, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess in short, uh, for conflict resolution and maybe jobs that player characters might see themselves on, what would kind of be that environment, that culture? Um, so Cahokia has a lot of things that need doing. Um, there are monsters in the world. And like I said before, this is the first time, this is a 50 year period 
that is really the first time that's been so long the world hasn't been actively trying to kill everyone. So it's really the first time and people are only just now getting to the point where they trusted enough to not immediately start shifting back the moment they step one toe outside of their little safe zones that a lot of what needs done is exploration. It is finding out what's out there uh, because moccasing is a big place and there are people living all across it, but they don't talk to each other. There are people living all across it, but there's large sections that still need filling in on the maps. What's still there? There are stories that people tell from long ago of, uh, you know, when you think about the uh, T-Swak Alliance, for instance, there are people that talk about how on the far side of the country, they have seen stories of um, giant creatures out to sea that fountain water surely those can't still exist um they talk about mountains far in the south that rain fire perhaps that's still there they talk about a big rock on the coast that might or might not still be there there are these yutsu barges these yutsu trains these well-worn paths throughout uh, the wilderness, but there is still a wilderness. There is still dark places that need explored. Um, and that's putting aside all the things that happen in Cahokia itself. Um, you know, you're going to be a little light on rat killing quests, but pest extermination comes in all forms. And it really just depends on what kind of character you want to play what situations they're going to find themselves in. Um, if you play a Suyata, you can expect that you are going to be assigned by the council to do various small tasks. And you'd better do them, or you won't be a Suyata for much longer. Yeah, I'm just thinking of how interesting it might be to have a, like, a story where there is a Suyata um, who's assigned to a banished character and then those are two player characters and oh yes yeah, so that'd be a, that would be an interesting story yeah it definitely would be um i don't know every time we do this i'm just like oh the possibilities oh man but we'll get i guess we can get into that later when we do our um sections on storytelling uh mm -hmm. in this. um but i think that is it now that we are now ending the yes the we are coming to the close yeah i apologize chat my brain has been a little bit scattered this morning um but i think it's because i didn't drink my morning tea that i usually do so maybe a break here um rit rituals i guess then you're just all all over place but yes, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think is super duper important for the chat to know about this beautiful and, you know, just inspiring setting? So I honestly think I've hit just about everything I wanted to talk about. Um, and yeah, if the chat has any other questions, um, I can be reached on Instagram at Logan Bowes. Um, I can be reached at Twitter at Akichiwe which is at A-K-I-I-C-H-I-W-E uh, because I'm insane and chose to use an actual absolga word for my Twitter handle. Um, insane or innovative? That's the question. <laughs> mm. Well, the difference is largely one of success, isn't it? I mean, now that I know how to spell it, I will never not know how to spell it. So, education. <laughs> And where can our lovely guests find you? Uh, yes, you can find me, Jade Valkyrie. Most places is Jade Valkyrie, like below my head. Um, you can find me on Twitch as Jade Valkyrie with a three. Um, I also do play um, some tabletop myself. I'm in a um, at homebrew D&D &D 5e uh, actual play stream um, over on Feywild and Out on Mondays. We're starting back up this next Monday, which is really cool. Um, and then in September, I will also be playing another one that's very spooky, uh, 
also ironically a very very european i'm not gonna lie um it's based off a lot of germanic and celtic vibes um so the opposite of what we're talking about um but that would be wednesdays with diversification uh, Yes, it is. And honestly, I've been learning Although, lots more about that folklore, to be honest. <laughs> did you say uh, Feywild and Out? Yes. Hmm. Well, I think everyone else should stick around because uh, we should probably do a raid. And since Jade suggested Feywild and Out, that seems as good a place as any. Yes. Um, actually, the reason why I'm suggesting that is because um, they're actually the people over there are being very lovely and are raising money for a, my mobility aid. Um, so I felt that the least we could do is to give them um, the the views that they need um, for that uh, because I'm extremely, extremely grateful for them doing so. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I can pop it into the channel at the channel chat. Hopefully that works. Um, but yeah. Uh, Oh yeah, I can do that. Ba, 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 da, da, da. I forgot that if you you for most people, using the links are bad because I mean, nine times out of ten it's going to be spam, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but thank you all so much for hanging out with us. Um, be sure to stick around in I believe two weeks now, yeah. um, where we'll be discussing more about Feywild and Out. I mean, not Feywild and Out, about Coyote and Crow. Yikes. Um, we're going over to Feywild and out, and yes, and we're gonna get that path of the cat, aren't we? <laughs> he doesn't know what he does. Until next time, everyone. Shinnok Diwagawak.